Good morning, I am Tammy, as Todd said. If you are new to Colonial, or if maybe you just haven't been here for the last few weeks, our lead pastor, Jim West, has uh, been gone for a few weeks now. He's been doing a pastor retreat, study leave, and this week he is on vacation with his family. He'll be back next week, but today you get me. We are, for better or worse, we are at the end of a three-week series called Healthy Habits. It's about those spiritual disciplines that we as Christians are called to practice. Two weeks ago, Todd challenged us to start simplifying our lives, which is not simple. Um, he encouraged us to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness, and that will allow us to create the margin that we need in our lives. Last week, Corey challenged us to change our study habits or to rethink knowledge. He gave us the acronym SOAP to use in our personal Bible study times um, and encouraged us to focus less on gaining knowledge and more on applying what we read in scripture, thus gaining understanding. Today, we're going to take a look at solitude, in which it has similarities to both simplicity and study, yet it's very different. It's the idea of stopping, of taking a break from the craziness of life and just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And while solitude includes aspects of scripture meditation and simplicity, the goal is to create a space in which you can listen to God and allow him to transform you. According to Jim, all good sermons have three points. So today we're going to talk about the who, the why, and the how of solitude. Who does God really expect to seek out solitude with him? Why is it important? And how do we go about doing that in today's world? But before we get into all of that, let's pray. Father God, we do live in a chaotic world. And there are so many things banging on the door, demanding our attention. But you call us to just breathe through that. You call the weary and the burdened, and you tell us that you're going to give us rest. And Lord, we confess that that's us. We are weary and burdened. So as we come here today, Lord, I pray that your spirit would fall on these people. That, that they would hear you in a new way. And that in this coming week, when life gets crazy, they would just stop. And they would breathe you in. In your name we pray, amen. So some of you may know that just last May I graduated from seminary. It took me five years, a little longer than planned, but, but I did it. The last five years I have been balancing a somewhat chaotic schedule as I tried to juggle seminary and family life and working part-time for the church. When I first started, I only took one class a semester, so the juggling was a little bit easier, but I quickly realized that I was never going to graduate at that rate. <laughs> um, so for the last four years, I've taken two, even three classes at a time. Um, like all families in Johnson County, my husband and I have three kids. Apparently, that's a rule here, three kids, um, and they're all busy. Eric travels for work, so often... The weekday grind of managing the house and the kids and their schedule falls on my shoulders. So my average day the last four years, not every day, but a typical day looks something like this. I would wake up sometime in the 5 a.m. hour, usually by 5 a.m., sometimes as late as 5.45, but in that range, I would study for as long as I could while the house was still quiet. At 6.30, we started the rotation of kids waking up, getting breakfast, and getting out of the door. And by 8.15, everybody was where they belonged, and it was the dog's turn. You might think I could skip that step, but Murphy is a two-year-old Newfoundland mix. He weighs in at over 100 pounds. There's no ignoring this dog or skipping his daily exercise. Between 9 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. were classes, 
more studying, household chores, dinner prep, um, errands to run, whatever else came up that needed to be done. If I had lunch, it was maybe a bite or two shoved in while I was juggling at least one to two other tasks simultaneously. At 3.30, Isabella and Nate came home on the bus. I went to school to pick up JT, and then came the after-school shuffle. The hours between 4 p.m. and 8.30 were endless. Pick drop-offs and pickups, quick bites, homework in the car, theirs and mine. At least one, if not all three kids, always had somewhere they needed to be. Isabella rides horses. She spends four to five days a week at her barn. Nate's in theater. He spends three days a week at the culture house. JT always has some sort of sport going on. We limit them to one activity at a time, but life is still crazy. On Wednesdays, all three kids had church activities. On Thursdays, I did a Bible study and a grow group all last year. Somehow, I would get everybody home between 8 and 9 p.m. We could download our day. We could eat if you missed the family meal time, shower, and prep for the next day. Eventually, I would make it to bed, exhausted, overwhelmed, knowing that tomorrow the alarm would once again go off at 5 a.m., and I would wake up and do it all over again. By year three of seminary, my caseload had once again increased, and it was clear that this was not going to be a sustainable schedule. I barely made it through year four. I was exhausted, overwhelmed, overextended, running way past empty. I was not going to make it another year. Certainly not by my own strength. The problem was not so much my schedule. It, it was crazy. But the problem was that I was attempting to maintain this schedule by my own power and will. I had somehow gotten my priorities all out of whack, and the need to complete an assignment had become more important than spending time with Jesus. And the less time I spent with Jesus, the more I had to rely on my own strength to survive, and I couldn't. I was not enough. If I was going to make it even one more year, I had to stop. And I had to figure out how to create space for God in the midst of an insane schedule. Can any of you relate to this? Can any of you relate to being so overwhelmed with your schedule, your job, your kids, your school, your endless tasks, all those things that have to be done each and every day that you wear yourself out? Are you, like I was, completely overwhelmed? This isn't just adults. How many of you kids feel like you're too busy to spend time with God. If that is you, and it isn't just me, then I need to tell you that this is not the plan that God has for you. He does not want you overwhelmed and stressed out and too busy to be the light that he's called you to be. He designed each of us to need communion and interaction with him. And we can only be the people God created us to be when we spend time with him. Our culture has for some reason determined that life should be lived with little to no margin. We are addicted to adrenaline. We go, 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 and do, do, do. And society has convinced us this is just the way life is. If you want to be a success, if you want your kids to be a success, then this is the game you have to play. But I disagree. We thrive on busyness. The busier we are, the more important we are, right? And we are very important 
people. Well, if ever in the history of the world there was someone who was very important, who had a lot on his plate and an overwhelming amount to accomplish, it was Jesus. Though there are days you may feel like you have the weight of the world on your shoulder, Jesus literally had the weight of the world on his. So what kept Jesus from being overwhelmed and overworked and stressed out? Let's stand and read Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It's short, sweet, and infinitely wise. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. All right, have a seat. Thank you. Jesus' answer to the chaos and busyness of life was solitude. Finding time to regularly and consistently connect with God one-on-one. -on -one. This isn't the only scripture reference that mentions Jesus stopping and seeking out solitude. This is a discipline that Jesus practiced over and over again. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Jesus started his ministry in solitude, spending 40 days alone in the desert. In Luke 6, chapter 12 through 16, before Jesus chose his 12 apostles out of all of his disciples, he has spent the night in the desert alone talking with God. In Matthew 14, 13, when Jesus learned of John the Baptist's death, he withdrew to a lonely place. And just after that, in Matthew 14, 23, after feeding the 5,000, the next thing Jesus did was go off by himself to pray. This pattern of stopping and, and stepping away from the busyness of life to spend solitary time with God is a consistent aspect of Christ's life while he walked on this earth. And as followers of Christ, we are called to live as he lived. We're called to seek times of solitude with the one who created us. God created each of us to need this time of connection and communion with him. And many of us get that. Many of us regularly spend time studying God's word and praying. And some of us might even practice solitude. But many of us don't. I'm going to say something that will sound really harsh. And you might not like it. And I'm sorry. But here it goes. How you spend your time is a reflection of your priorities. And if you spend no time with God, your actions indicate that he is not a priority. I know, I know you're going to push back. Many of you are probably thinking, now wait, I love Jesus, and I would spend more time with him, but that right there, that but, that's your priority. Maybe it's work, maybe it's school, maybe it's your family, your kids, maybe it's sports practices, maybe it's your need to watch an entire Netflix series in less than a week, whatever it is that is keeping you from the feet of Jesus, that is your priority. When something is important to you, you make the time to do it. If something is not important to you, you don't. Because how you spend your time is a reflection of your priorities. I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. Honestly, there is no shame in where you are at right now. Jesus loves you just as you are. 
He delights in you. Whether you have never spent time at his feet or whether you go on weekend retreats, just God and you, he loves you right where you are. But you can't stay there. He wants you to go deeper. He wants more of you and he wants you to know more of him. It's also imperative that you understand that spending time with Jesus is not an item on some legalistic Christian checklist that you have to do or you're not a Christian. That is 100% not true. Spending time with Jesus is something you do out of love. It should not come from a place of guilt or shame, but out of relationship. You do this in response to the all-consuming love that he has showered on you and out of the love you have in return for him. This is an act of worship. A life that is pleasing to God is not a series of religious duties, but life in relationship and intimacy with him. That is what he's longing for, and that is is what solitude is all about. I know you have a lot on your plate. I do too. Jesus loves you right where you are, and that isn't going to change. He also knows that the only way for you to be the person he created you to be is by spending time with him. Jesus had a lot on his plate. That verse that we just read, the one where Jesus woke up early in the morning, that morning was the morning after the Sabbath. And if you look back at chapter 1, verses 21 through 34, it describes the kind of day Jesus had. Like most Sabbaths, he spent the day in the synagogue, and the people were amazed by his teaching, so he was teaching all day. That particular day, there was a man at the synagogue who had been possessed by a demon. And Jesus drove out the demon once again, amazing all the people there. And word started to spread. Once Jesus left the synagogue, he went to Simon's house for some rest. But Simon's mother-in-law was sick with fever. So Jesus healed her. And by the time the sun had set and the Sabbath day was over, People were lining up around their house. They brought their sick and their demon-possessed. Verse 33 says, The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus spent the evening and long into the night healing the sick and driving out demons. And then, very early the next morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus was just as busy as you and me. He had just as much going on and just as many reasons not to spend time with God. But he did. He regularly stopped and spent time with his Father. And as followers of Christ, we are called to follow Christ. And to emulate what he did. And Christ regularly sought out times of solitude with God. Point one. Everyone, no matter how young or old, no matter how busy you are, you are called to practice the spiritual discipline of solitude. Regardless of what your intimacy with Christ looks like right now, he wants more. What makes this discipline of solitude so important? The thing is, spiritual disciplines are not about conforming you to some impossible Christian mold, but about transforming you into the person God created you to be. And there is no better spiritual discipline for allowing God to work in you to transform you than the discipline of solitude. When we stop and spend time with God, that is when God is able to do his good work in us. He who began a good work in you will carry it out to completion. 
And solitude gives him the perfect opportunity to do just that. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 4 through 5 says, To bear fruit, we must remain in the vine. Jesus told his followers, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Look, if your life is lacking spiritual fruits, if you um, are lacking love, lacking joy, lacking peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Perhaps it's because you have not been abiding in Christ. So how do we do that? How do we remain in the vine and abide in Christ? 1 John 2, 5 through 6 says, By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Jesus spent time with God. He stopped and sought out solitude with his Father. And when we do the same thing, we are walking as he walked. We're abiding in Christ. And we will begin to bear fruit. You will experience more love, more joy, more peace, more patience than you have ever known. God will begin to transform you to who he created you to be. I need to be clear about this, though. The act of a spiritual discipline, any spiritual discipline, but especially solitude, in and of itself, what you are doing is not what will transform you or cause you to bear spiritual fruit. It is not your work that does this, but the work that God is able to do in you when you allow it to happen. What happens when you seek solitude with Jesus is not your work, but the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't become more holy because you stopped and spent time with God. You become more holy because of what God is able to do in you when you give him your undivided attention. A farmer is not capable of growing grain. He can only create the right conditions. He can plow the field and fertilize it. He can plant the seed and water it, but he cannot make that seed come up. Only God can do that. And the same is true of your quiet time with God. You can't transform yourself. You can only create the right conditions for God to transform you. Practicing a spiritual discipline in and of itself does nothing. Our actions cannot make us righteous. Only Christ can do that. Point two, why should we seek out solitude with God? Because solitude creates the right conditions for God to do a good work in us. So how do we go about doing this? I am willing to bet that there are some of you who have never practiced the spiritual discipline of solitude. And I know for a fact that many of you are far more experienced in this than I am. The thing is, I can't tell you how to practice solitude because it looks different for each of us. Jim goes fishing. I detest fishing. Please don't tell him I said that. I want to keep my job. The truth of the matter is, I'm not likely to encounter Jesus when I'm stuck on a boat. I'm just, I'm not. It will look different for me. Solitude looks different whether you're a kid or a teenager or an adult. It looks different if you're in the midst of a busy career or if you're retired. It looks different if you've, if you've practiced the discipline before. If you've never sat at the feet of Jesus, the first time you do it, your time will be short. Maybe you're ready to go on a weekend retreat with him if you've been doing it for a while. Regardless of where you are in your discipline, there are a few common components. First off, 
There is no right or wrong way to practice solitude. Honestly, the primary requirement is a longing after God, a desire to know him more intimately. The inner attitude of the heart is far more crucial than any mechanics when it comes to sitting at the feet of Jesus. Neither skill nor knowledge is needed to go to God. The other necessary component is silence. Richard Foster goes so far to, as to say, without silence, there is no solitude. It is only when we are silent that we are able to hear God's still, small voice. Remember, the goal of solitude is not to gain knowledge or, or to study, but to create a space for God to work in us and to transform us. God will rarely try to talk over you. So in order to hear him, we have to be quiet. For the final component, I would point you to Jesus and encourage you to follow his steps to solitude. Even though he had to have been exhausted, working late into the night, Jesus got up early while it was still dark. I know most of you hate getting up early in the morning, and I, I do too. I do it, but I hate it. The good news is, Jesus didn't always spend his time of solitude in the morning. When you look back at the scriptures, there's no discernible pattern to when he sought out solitude. Sometimes it was early in the morning. Sometimes it was in the evening after a long day of work. Sometimes it was when he was exhausted, and sometimes it's when his heart was broken. Jesus took the time to stop and seek out God whenever he could and whenever he needed it. What happens during solitude comes from the Holy Spirit, absolutely. But you have to be intentional about creating the time and the space. That's what makes it a discipline. Jesus almost always goes off to a solitary place. He doesn't expect to find solitude in the midst of people. Jesus not only woke up early, but he went away from the hustle and bustle of a busy household. In order to be alone with God, to connect with him, seek solitude away from any potential distraction. Maybe taking an entire day or even an afternoon away from the house isn't realistic for you. I get that. I am right there with you. But you can create a space in your house where you can just sit at the feet of Jesus for me, um, when it's nice outside and it's not raining five inches, I'll sit on my deck. During the winter months, I have a Jesus chair in my bedroom, or if Eric's still asleep, then it's the kitchen table. It's about creating a place where you can go and be uninterrupted while you spend time with the one who created you. If you're a parent of a young child, I want you to know that I know what it's like to have young kids in the house. For them to get up at the crack of dawn and need you for the next 23 and a half hours straight. And let me tell you that you need this time with Jesus. So be creative. Put a video on. Swap kids with a neighbor. Whatever it takes, you need to sit with Jesus. And to those of you who have busy careers and, and, and relentless school demands, I am right there with you. And let me tell you, that you need Jesus. Those days when you are booked from sunrise to sunset, those are the days that you need him the most. You were never intended to get through those kind of days on your own. Those are the days that you need Christ and his overflowing love in you so that you can overflow to the people around you. And that happens in solitude. Point three, there's no right or wrong way to spend solitude. Find a time and a space where you're free of interruptions. Go to God with a willing heart and a desire to know him more intimately. And then be silent. If you want more practical, like tell me how to do it stuff, there's a great resource on Colonial's Bless website. 
Go to www.colonialkc.org slash bless. You might not have even known this resource exists. It's fabulous. When you get there, there's three columns of resources. Um, and the third column is entitled Reading Resources. And the first link is called Chair Time by Dan Sutherland. It's short. It's easy to read. You can do it in one sitting. It is highly convicting and super practical ways to just sit and listen to Christ. Shortly after my near breakdown of year four, I started regularly taking a break from school and just sitting with Jesus. Often I would cry and he would listen and then I would be silent and let him talk. And he would strengthen me, and he would give me clarity, and he'd get me back on the right track. I not only made it through year five, I even thrived a little bit. Even though my schedule didn't change, I just wasn't trying to do it on my own anymore. I learned that I can truly do all things through Christ who strengthens me if I will just allow him to do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are our very breath. We were not called to go through this life on our own, but through the strength that only you can give us, Lord. And so I pray that in the weeks to come, each of us would Take the time to just stop and to sit at your feet and to let, them, to let you do a good work in them. In your name we pray, amen.